Pinkerton's Ghosts is a horror anthology podcast by Superversive Radio, with no affiliation with any detective agency, person real or imagined, or the dark forces of Outreterre. It is not intended for children. still works um jack morrow here i've got the dubious honor of being the first to upload a mission statement on the new servers they better get the old ones back up morrow a lot of good work down the train i am an agent of the paranormal pinkerton detective agency no even if the pay exists it does not nor is it connected to any surviving pinkerton made businesses I don't think they even know I exist. My job is simple. Control sends me a message. I go check it out. Some poor sap got stuck in a ghost dance. Or is he just inhaling mushrooms at a rave? A vampire draining blood? Or your friendly serial killer, friskily looking for new paint? When I discover the answer, I go out and do dirty work for the special boys and girls upstairs. When I'm done... I return to whatever motel I call base and record my experiences per policy. Control sent me a text message earlier today. At Graham State Park in Missouri, there have been reports of missing people as well as persons entering the forest late at night. The missing people return after 24 hours. We have other agents working with the formerly missing individuals. Your mission is to infiltrate the grounds within Graham's Cave State Park, discover the source of the disturbance, and without putting the public at risk of discovering you, or what's causing this issue, end the situation. If you cannot, escape and report back. Transcript of the Puppeteer to follow. I traveled to Montgomery City, just near Graham Cave State Park, in good time. Walked on foot to the location. The official bounds of the state park are defined as a few miles from me. The forest is unbroken, and the GPS coordinates lead me nearer to the town than the park borders. Not confusing at all. I carried food, water, and a first aid kit that could perform surgery. I armed myself with my grandfather's 1911 with enough magazines to get me out of trouble with any waiting nasty. Set of knives, illegal in the uncivilized states on either coast, my last grenade, and several reliable sources of fire. I know the training wars against fire, but damn if it isn't useful. Hides evidence, too. Sure, lighting the children's hospital on fire was a bad look, but I still say I was justified. What died was already dead. One of the things I like about Missouri is that the parks are really close to civilization, even mixed in with the cities and suburbs. Not a long walk from my car. I bet I could have run for it if I had to. I kept quiet and low. An old Shawnee taught my training group how to walk quietly in the forest, how to be unseen among the underbrush. I found the trail, cutting through a grove of maples. Unnatural things never use a main entrance or a proper trail. It's like this. I and any of the other paranormal Pinkerton agents have found that nothing wholesome calls us out. No miracles ever get a visit from me. Using the main entrance, greeting people, saluting the flag or your pastor, or not smelling like death, are all hallmarks of a sane and healthy mind. Sane and healthy minds with a love for God, for fellow humans, himself, do not get involved with ghosts, shadow people, aliens, and demons, except as thrills, never believing them real. I don't know whether they're protected against evil, or just evil avoids them. I reviewed the information. The usual victims who refused to talk about it, or witnesses who had seen the event. There were no police reports, no newspaper clippings. In this case, since the event was weekly, it's more useful for me to see for myself than wander around talking to suspicious townies. Rural Missourians are nice, hospitable, and friendly, but they don't like outsiders, and they're far more cynical than they present on the outside. I buried myself in some prickly bushes and waited. 
Summer heat and humidity boiled me and my water bottle empty far faster than my sweat sacks. The insects in Missouri are murderous, especially in summer. The old Shawnee once told me the tiny things knew when someone hated them, and they hated back. It made them hungry. I suffered for one and a half hours before I saw the man walk down their trail. I couldn't see his face from where I was hidden, but I could see his body. He walked like exaggerated pantomimes of walking. Each motion was correct, like a soy burger can look correct. But it was different. It was, uh... Uh, jerky. When we walk, we don't think about each motion. We think about walking in the action. I want to walk to the fridge and gorge my face on ice cream. You get up. You walk to the fridge and open it up. You think about which gallon of ice cream to eat. There are flaws, gasping breaths, or maybe you bang your toe on the table leg. You know how to move without thinking about it. The guy moved like he had to think about every joint and limb. Each part moved on its own with its own mind. With each step it lifted its foot, the knee raised, and it moved forward. The fist moved up and pumped forward, sticking out into the air. The foot dropped straight down, then the next foot moved up, the fist was out, swung down and behind him. Each motion clipped and more like the twitch of a seizure victim than anything I had seen before. He passed by in silence. I waited for a few moments and followed while I could still see him. The trail was thin, only wide enough for one person at a time. If I had not been looking for it, I would not have found it. He moved fast, and I was slowed down by checking behind me for any other of the robot-like walkers. Now the sun began to set, and I had seen no other puppets. Much of the paranormal is dramatic timing. Bad things happen at sunset, midnight, and the worst at dawn. Almost nothing at noon. At this point, I wished it was night. Visual hazards are part and parcel of the paranormal. The better you can see the paranormal, the more it affects you. But even unseen, they are dangerous. It's like inviting a vampire to your house. You only invited one the first night. Where did the whole coven come from? This deep into the forest, someone had carved symbols into the bark of the upper tree limbs. I did not recognize them. Cult research is more Jim Donovan and Holt Lucari's territory than mine. For the record, three long scratches pierce the sides at the exact middle of isosceles triangle. These three lines spiral together into a single deep dot. I'm sure it was just an optical illusion, but the damned dots were moving within the triangle, pictures attached in the drop packet. We passed into a deep part of the forest. The air changed, growing heavier than even humid Missouri norm. I could feel the moisture with every breath. Mist grew at our feet and rose to hide the very tree branches, but it didn't limit visibility, quite the opposite. It revealed strings in the fog. The man in front of me, still walking deeper in, each of his joints, the fingers to the tips of his toes, were puppeted from a source far above his head. Each motion preceded by a tug on a silver thread. Lines cut through the mists, leaving canyons and trails that had no end to them except the red and purple sky above. I couldn't see who pulled the strings. Instead, the vibrating lines twisted and warped as the man broke his singular focus and pulled to the right. The turn was violent, his joints creaking and his bones turning almost to the breaking point. His clothing had been simple, t-shirt and jeans. But now I saw cuts from the tree branches he ignored. The strings passed through physical matter like it wasn't even there. I saw string pass into a branch, leaving ripples in reality like a fishing line through water. He took a right turn and then another. By the fourth perfect 90 degree angle, I realized he was leading me in circles. I don't claim to be smart, but I can tell when somebody's leading me around. I waited for the halfway mark, then cut deeper into the forest. I pushed into the mark square and carefully made my way to the center. There's always a core to these things. They're not natural. So they need something to anchor them to our reality. Or to filter out the right power, or just set the mood. If the mood is right, then magic, or 
power is easier. It's more than just some Halloween decorations, though. You have to put that desire into it, that authenticity. Deeper in, I saw the symbols carved into the bark pointed in the direction I had traveled. Then they came in pairs, triplets, and quadrants. I could see the silver lines that held up the puppeteered man vibrating against the symbols. Sometimes the strings would flick from one to another. It reminded me of a spider pulling its web from one foundation strand to the next. I stopped. A noose, barely visible in the mist, floated before my nose. I could see the line go through the air up into one of the symbols above my head before trailing deeper into the woods. I pulled one of my shall we say, more delicate knives, and cut the thing. It was like hair. Dry, not quite rough, not quite smooth. It stuck to my bare skin until I tugged it out, taking with it a pinprick of skin and blood. I tried to burn it with a lighter, and the effect was slow as unsatisfying. I could barely see a few feet ahead of me, and I scraped through the last set of trees and found myself in the center of a copse. Instead of a tree, maple, pine, or otherwise, there was a massive set of vines and honeysuckle, propping up a concrete triangle. I could feel pressure coming from it. An aura. The concrete totem was in the same shape of the symbols. Isosceles triangles with lines spreading into it before swirling into a hole in the middle. The strings focused onto a point within the hole of the concrete triangle. The point itself was a black metal spindle held in the air. It spun, twisted, and pulled within the center of the strings. Now to do a little more investigating. Old Mr. Pinkerton, bless his moldering bones, would be proud of me. Flashlight in hand, I searched for fingerprints and found none. I roughed up the ground more than whoever put this here. Silver strings stretched down and I was very careful to touch everything with my gloves and nothing with my head. There's no strange mad scrambled writing, no prophecy of doom. I can't even find a dang signature on the concrete triangle. I tried to cut out the spindle at the center of it. The strings reattached as soon as I cut them. It was frustrating. Well, I'm glad that I still have a soul. Sometimes I wish I had magic to pull this thing apart and discover its source without all the hard work or research. This knowledge teased at me. Weeks of silence from control and then a new mission and... and... what? Nothing? I couldn't topple the concrete triangle, and I couldn't break enough of the strings to stop its function. By now, the darkness of night and mist had become total. I didn't bother to check my cell phone or my watch. Time would either be flowing normally, or it would not. This didn't have the heavy, stretchy, sticky damn feel of time manipulation. At this point, I have two choices. I can try to do something with it, or I can call out for support. I get paid the same, and... Honestly, it's easier to run away once a poor agent like myself does his due diligence. These things come down to personal job satisfaction. I did have my last grenade, and an explosion would fix my mood. I bet it could have cracked this thing and freed the guy who walked in the square pattern around the core. At the same time, I'm not gonna lie, I smiled when I pulled out my little party favor. I had no warning when the man, jerking like an unsold Pinocchio, walked into the cops and put his hand on my shoulder. He pulled me from my feet and threw me behind him, with strength quite unnatural. I dropped the grenade and tumbled several times before I came to a stop. I felt spiderweb brush the gap between my glove and sleeve. Before I had even caught my breath, I had my knife out and I sawed at the strings. It wasn't fast enough. I was wrenched up and it nearly pulled my shoulder out of socket. I stood so I could reach the string on my wrist. Then I caught a glimpse of something in the trees. It had too many limbs for any human in its eyes, black and bulbous, held a sharp intelligence. It had a spider silhouette, but the head was too long. It was a human. Or it had been. I cut away the strings on my arm before it could do much more to me and pulled out my 1911. This thing didn't stay for a new set of lung holes and scrambled away from sight. It moved... Uh, wrong... Like its joints were fighting itself, the hands twisted and rotated freely and at cross-purposes. 
can see there's a concept in martial arts that with the right leverage, anyone could throw the whole body any way you wanted by just a firm grip on the index finger. I don't think this thing was connected to itself enough. Like, if I had grabbed it, the hand would have stayed with me and this thing would have run off. The jerking man walked through the mist and I got a good look at his face. No one home. The eyes were dilated to the extreme. Full pits of blackness, no soul, no dreams. His closed mouth twisted in a grimace. I scrambled back. No need to kill a puppet. It robot walked towards me, its head and neck twisting and turning. Each joint a string attached to it twitched. He slugged me in the face. The hit was telegraphed to hell, but I still reeled from the thing in the trees. People like to think that they'd be able to handle a monster, and sure, something of flesh and blood, but something beyond, like that puppeteer, something not quite real, something that reached out and touched you in the soul with a hatred for everything you were, no, you're not ready. I've seen evil, and it still bothers me when the alcohol slips away and it's just me and the dawn. The bastard was wearing a ring, and I felt it crack a molar. I whipped out Bowie knife number two and cut the cords holding up his left arm. The punch stopped, and the hand flopped to his side. The lines twisted, unbalanced. The man stumbled, pulled up on the right side by his remaining strings. I charged him and slashed the lines above his head and arm. He thrashed, striking me a couple times, but he had no leverage in it. Eventually, he slumped down unconscious. The eyes were now properly focused for an unconscious man. No more wide, well deep blackness. I checked his right hand, like I thought, a Masonic ring. Some chump got in too deep, and something bit him. Ma always said you can't trust Masons. There's something that becomes inherent in the morality. I can trust a man by what he looks like, or by how he carries himself. How a man looks you in the eyes is the most obvious tell. How a man dresses tells you how much class he has, how much he values himself, and how low he lives within his own mind. A ring is different. It's not about specific character. It's about how he lives, his conscious choices. Is he married? Does he relive his high school life and glory days? Does he serve a false religion parasitically siphoning good men from society? I leave him, living, and go back for the, the triangle is where I left it. The strings were no longer spinning, pulling, tugging, and twisting. They hung limp, sickly, all the tension out of them. I stuck my surgical knife into the center of them and worked around until all the lines were severed. When the last one, on top, was cut, the spindle fell down and out onto the ground. Without using my bare hands, I picked it up and wrapped it in a handkerchief with some samples of web. I'll make sure to put it in the relic drop after I take a look at it myself. If I find anything interesting, I'll send it to Jim, Lesham, and Holt. Those eggheads love this stuff. I finished my investigations and found nothing else of note. There were no other marks, no writing, no other trails, besides the spiraling one Pinocchio there was following. I set the grenade in the center hole. The good thing about these weird relics is that they're delicate. Scratch them up. Put a good crack in them, or just slap a new coat of paint on the symbols, and you ruin a cultist's life work. As long as a symbol or relic is obscured in some way that cannot be recovered, they lose their... potency. I pulled the pen and quickly backed out. The ritual site has been marred. Anyone who comes after me will be able to tell what it was and how it worked. The symbols, with some strands still attached by means I cannot tell, are still there. I just hope the research crew reads my report. I know they're out for us field guys. I check the unconscious man again, then leave the area. The police will probably mark off anything they heard as a firework, but I don't want some busybody to make an issue of it. Last thing anyone wants is a police report with some random guy wandering out of the forest after an explosion. Paranormal Pinkertons are watched men. We can't leave records in police station. We shouldn't leave victims of our actions or witnesses of our crimes. 
If we ever get caught on camera, I can only hope that it's drunk after a job well done and not skinning a werewolf. I left the area without incident. I'll file the paperwork in the usual place with a relic in the drop site. I'll leave drawings, locations, material requests, and the usual track at drop number 755 out of St. Louis, Missouri. I'm starving. Best part of the Midwest is their barbecue restaurants. I've got half a cow in the styrofoam box on the bed next to me and a decent can of beer. I'll be waiting for the next mission from Control. Jack Morrow, out. Pinkerton's Ghosts is a podcast distributed by Superversive Radio, licensed under an attribution non-commercial share-alike international license. This episode was written and performed by Ben Wheeler. Ben Wheeler edits, directs, produces, and herds cats. Visit us on Facebook. Read articles on SuperversiveSF.com. And wherever podcasts are distributed, you'll find us. Contact us through Twitter at Pinkerton's Ghosts or email us at Pinkerton's Ghosts at gmail.com. No apostrophe. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next one. <laughs>